Hello, Mr. Jones. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule for me. Hey, Isaac. No, I'm happy to. And, and for your dad, any time as well. So I'm glad to talk with you. Uh, Mr. Jones, how did you exactly get into writing biographies? Um, you know, it's funny. It's one of those things that um, when I was in college, I was an English major, and I always wanted to, you know, write a great novel and then realized that I didn't really know how to plot. Um, and so the great thing about biography is you don't really have to know how to plot. You have to know how to put a lot of information together. And um, I had actually been a staffer in the United States Senate for about 10 years. And as I found out sort of after the fact, I wasn't planning on it, but as I found out later, that was actually really good practice for doing biography. Uh, so, so the way I got into it finally is they always say you should write the book that you want to read. And I got really interested in Washington Irving at one point, and there wasn't a biography on him, or at least there hadn't been one written in a really, really long time. Um, and so I started doing a lot of research on him and decided I want to write a biography of Washington Irving, and that was how I got into writing biographies. That is uh, very interesting. Uh, but you told me you were an English major, but uh, what were some of your other interests when you were in high school and college? Uh, I ran a comic book store for a while, uh, so I'm a huge comic book fan. I'm still a huge fan of Batman. Very. Um, I watched a lot of movies, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan, which is why it was so great to write about George Lucas. Uh, I was a huge Muppet fan, which is why it was fun to write about Jim Henson. So, uh, you know, I, I spent a lot of time watching. Uh, I, I was I was around when cable TV really first started up, so I spent I spent a lot of time watching a lot of weird and interesting stuff on cable. That's how I became a fan of, you know, Monty Python and things like that. So I read I read a lot of stuff, and partly because I was an English major, and I watched a lot of stuff, and I listened to a lot of stuff. So uh, if I had to pick the thing I like to listen to the most, it's probably the Beatles, even though they broke up when, you know, when I was like two years old, but I love the Beatles. Uh, the Beatles are actually my favorite band, too. I, I oh, they're really them. good for you. Yeah. But uh, before writing the book, uh, how did Jim's work affect you when you were growing up? Well, as I always tell people, I was sort of the very first generation raised on Sesame Street because Sesame Street debuted in 1969, and I was two years old. So I was kind of the first group that you know Sesame Street was aimed at. So I was I always joked that I'm Sesame Street generation 1.0, um, and so you know I people my age I'm close I'm a little older than your dad but I'm I'm 50 51 actually now um, but people my age Jim Henson was always there in our lives anybody a little older than us us didn't, weren't raised on Sesame Street they were raised on you know something different so we I was sort of the first generation that had Jim Henson and the Muppets for Sesame Street and then when I was 10 or actually I was nine the Muppet Show came on and so you know I was I was a perfect audience for that I was nine when the Muppet Show came on. And then I, you know, remember when the Muppet movie came out, and I remember when the Dark Crystal came out, and I even remember when he died. So, you know, we were, I was sort of the first generation that Jim was always there for us. So that he, was, he was always really important to people my age in particular because we didn't have to wait for him to come along. Anybody a little older than us had to wait for him. Um, and then the other thing I always tell people is I was one of these kids that really liked to watch, you know, behind-the-scenes documentaries and things. And there's a great book called of Muppets and Men, which you might know about if you wrote a paper on Jim. Um, that's all about the making of the Muppet Show, and I used to check that book out of the library all the time, and read it from cover to cover. So I knew who all these guys were. You know, I knew the Muppets weren't magic. I knew that people did them, and that was a really important book to me. Um, so after writing his biography and finding out some little-known facts about him, uh, mm -hmm. is there anything else that interests you after writing it? Uh, you mean about Jim? Yes. Um, I, you know, I would love to go back. I, I, I think the period of his life in the 1960s before he got into Sesame Street is a really, really interesting period. I don't know if there's enough there to write a full book on it, but he was doing a lot of really neat, cool experimental things, and I would love to go back and look at you know, a lot of those in depth. And he really wanted to do um, like a live-action Broadway show, 
um, where you could see the puppeteers and the performers on stage. And people told me it was crazy that nobody would like that. And, you know, they do it all the time with the Lion King, for example, on stage. So I think going back and looking at that even more would be really, really interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, reading about some of the commercials and the biography, and uh, when I was little, I watched the Latoy Dragon. I've always loved that one. Wilkins. Oh yeah. And Wilkins and Wonkins love those mm-hmm. guys. But yeah, I really like the Wilson's Meat commercials. And you notice, I don't even think they get mentioned in the book because we just couldn't figure out a way, figure out a way to get it in. Um, but uh, anyway, how much time did you put in the research? Um, all total, that book took about five years, uh, and for a, the, maybe the first two years was me just getting to know the Henson family and convincing them to let me write it, and then, so that took about two years, and then I did another maybe very intense year and maybe year and a half of research and interviewing people, and then took another maybe year and a half, uh, almost two years to write it. Um, how much fun was it to look through the art and the pitches and the footage? It, it's really fun. I mean, that's the kind of thing when, you, when you're a biographer in particular, you really love um, going through archives, and especially something like Jim's archives where the guy liked to save everything. Like, you know, what, what's, really, what's really fun about Jim is he would go through, you know, every six weeks or so, so, he would kind of go through everything he had in his pockets and empty it out and put it in a box. So he saved everything, and so then he has a really great archivist named Karen Falk who has arranged all that stuff and put them in folders and boxes and looks out for it. So you're going in there, and you're getting to you know, see things and touch things and play with things that Jim actually owned and you know, touched and played with, and that makes it really fun for a researcher. And one of the things that I always make sure I do, especially when you're in an archive like that, is you, you, know, you open up a folder and you take out a piece of paper, maybe a contract, and you read it, but always turn it over and look at the back side of it where someone may have written something they didn't think anyone would ever be looking for. And you'll find, you know, fun things written in the margins and, you know, things like that. So so going going into the archives really is sort of like, you know, at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when they go into the warehouse with all the stuff in it. I mean, it really, it really is kind of like that. It's like this just this gigantic, you know, room full of really cool stuff you just can't wait to start going through. I, I feel like I would love that. That would be a lot of fun to look through all of that. Um, yeah, you know, and even just walking through the, you know, their offices, the archives are actually in the workshop where they make the Muppets still to this day. And so, you know, even, so one half of the room is kind of the archives and the files and things like that. And in the middle of the room, there's people building, you know, when I was there, they were building costumes for Super Grover. So it's, it's really, it's really neat and really fun to see things like that. I'm sure that was a very nice, quiet place to do research, eh? It was really great, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, if you had to suggest five Henson productions to people that don't know a lot about who Jim Henson was, Mm-hmm. Uh, what would you uh, say or suggest? <laughs> um, well, I would tell them, you know, for sure to pick. I, w- I would probably tell them to watch the Steve Martin episode of The Muppet Show. Um, I think look at something like Timepiece, because even though it's kind of a weird thing and it's a little short, it's definitely very telling about Jim's mentality as an artist. Uh, so it's it's very important to you know to hit, to understanding Jim's mind. Uh, something like Dark Crystal, definitely, which, again, is one of those things that people feel very strongly about it. I, I, I will tell you, I personally am not a huge fan of Dark Crystal, but people absolutely love it, and it was really important to Jim. Uh, and Labyrinth was another one that's hugely important to Jim because it looked exactly it – w- it was the project that everyone said was the closest one to him. Uh, and then if I had to pick another, or, you know, a, a different, w- one more project, I think I would, t- I think I would tell people to look at the pitch reel for the Muppet Show. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to choose from. I don't know if I could settle on just five. So. No, I don't think I could either, especially because I really didn't even get into any of the really early stuff. I think watching him uh, and Frank Oz performing Rolf on the Jimmy Dean show is just magical. Um, and also important, you know, make people understand they're doing that live as well the whole time. But uh, so it, it's hard. You always have to leave something out when you're trying to pick five. Yeah. Uh, so you've written biographies for other pop culture figures such as Washington Irving and George Lucas and now Dr. Seuss. When does the mm-hmm. Dr. Seuss biography come out? Hopefully it'll be out next May. M- next May? 
Mm-hmm. I may, tell, may of May of nineteen. Uh huh. I will tell you now. I will buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, good. Um. So, what are some of the similarities between George Lucas, Dr. Seuss, Washington Irving, and Jim Henson? Um. You know, the one of the b- big things about all four of those guys is they're well. They're always. Um, their, the work that they do is iconic, um, whether they knew it at the time or not. You know, Washington Irving is one of these guys that people don't necessarily know his his name, but if I start telling you what he did, they all everybody knows his work. For example, if I say, if I tell somebody, you know, uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, tell me the story of Ichabod Crane, people can start telling you the story, uh, you know, Ichabod Crane, and have, they they can give you very quick explanation even if they have never read the story um we kind of know that story i would say it's in our american dna and so irving's work is like that and jim henson's work is like that and george lucas's work is like that and dr seuss's work is like that. i always say i'll end up owning your childhood here eventually uh but, or or for you since you're still you're still you know a teenager i own your life at that point when i having done jim henson dr seuss and george lucas yeah i guess you do <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, sure. Thank you. And like I said, if you have any other questions, uh, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer. Okay. Goodbye. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Thanks, Isaac. Bye.